Excellencies, Director General Elizabeth Maruma Morema, Executive Secretary of the CBD, Mrs. Bibi Amina Gurib Fakim, Mrs. Shakuntala Tilstead, distinguished speakers, dear participants, colleagues, and friends. Welcome back to the second day of the global dialogue on the whole of food and agriculture in the global biodiversity framework. Yesterday, we had an engaging debate, including family farmers, researchers, academia, representatives of the private sector, civil society, countries, and United Nations system. We heard many important messages that have been captured by our co-chairs and will be presented later this morning. The excellent question and answer session was also very dynamic, reflecting a high level of engagement from our participants. We look forward to more energetic debate during today's session, including the high level segment. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, it's now my pleasure to welcome the FAO Director General, Dr. Chu Dongyu, for his opening remarks. You have the floor, Director General. Thank you, Samedo, honorable ministers, Mrs. Elizabeth Maruma uh, Rema, Executive Secretary of the CBD. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning from Iran. Welcome to the second day of the, our global dialogue. Yesterday, we hear the inspiring message from many different actors who are working to mainstream biodiversity across the agricultural sectors. The voice included farmers and the indigenous people, scientists and research and others. We witnessed a rich discussion illustrating essential role biodiversity plans for agricultural food production. And we learned about the concrete examples of biodiversity mainstreaming. We all agree that the biodiversity has to play a key role for an in agriculture. The question is how? I believe that the, yesterday the presentation had a clear message. It is possible to conserve and sustainably use the biodiversity for food and agriculture while at the same time meeting the growing demand for food and other agricultural products. Another important message was the people and nature cannot be separate and the agricultural sector are the part of the solution. I thank the distinguished speakers. We had the pleasure to listen to yesterday an audience who participated in discussions. As a special thanks to our co-hosts, co-chairs for facilitating the dialogue for preparing the interim conclusions, which they will present later in this morning session. Ladies and gentlemen, in my opening remarks yesterday, I spoke about the critical role of the biodiversity for food and agriculture, about the need to mainstream biodiversity across the food and agriculture sector, which is the key to the FA vision for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. This is the core of our new strategy for working Remind us of the important role smallholders play as uh, creators and uh, custodian of biodiversity in agri-food systems. The transformation of agri-food systems towards greater sustainability ultimately depends on action at the national and the local level. The challenge for country is to create an enabling policy market environment to stimulate and scale up the biodiversity friendly production and phase out harmful practices. Often the cost of the transition are presented as a barrier to biodiversity mainstreaming. But the global pandemic has dem demonstrated the fragility of agri-food systems and the ter terrible cost that can follow when the shocks occur. Investing in the resilience and the prevention is certainly cheaper than addressing the consequences of climate and biodiversity crisis. Early this year, the Desa Gavata reviewed, provided an independent analysis of economic of biodiversity. The report highlighted the harmful trade offs associated with the most agro agricultural subsidiary schemes. Repositioning this investment to promote the public good, 
is an excellent opportunity to finance a biodiversity mainstream in the agricultural sector. By adopting the strategic action plan on mainstream and biodiversity across the agricultural sectors, FAO members have demonstrated the commitment of the food and agricultural sectors to this important task. FAO stands ready to provide a related policy and technical support to its members. We will continue to act as a neutral platform and a convener to facilitate the exchange of experience on biodiversity mainstream at all levels. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the critical decade for the climate action to recite our relationship with the nature and to fulfill the ambitions of the 2030 agenda. In the media, immediate future, we look to uh, UN First Summit and UN Biodiversity Conference as key opportunities to build the political will willingness and to establish the ambitious post-2020 framework that recognizing the opportunity to address the multiple sustainability challenges through the biodiversity mainstreaming in the agricultural sectors. This global dialogue provides a critical input to these processes. I look forward to this panel discussion and wish you all and continue the productive meetings. I thank you. Over to you, Samantha. Thank you, Director General, for providing us this forward-looking perspective focused on the implementation of biodiversity mainstreaming at all levels, global, regional, and country level, and reminding us that people and nature cannot be separated, and the agriculture is part of the solution and also that FAO is ready to provide policy and technical support to its members. Once again, I am pleased to welcome the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biodiversity, Elizabeth Maruma Marema. Elizabeth, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Elena. Honorable Dr. Chu Dong Yu. Director General, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to join this high level segment on the role of food and agriculture in the global biodiversity framework and sincerely thank Dr. Dong Zhu and the co-chairs of yesterday's global dialogue for facilitating and synergizing synthesizing important discussions on the critical role of biodiversity and food systems both have in supporting each other. In today's segment, by bringing together honorable ministers of agriculture and environment, we have another incredible opportunity to foster the much needed discussions and round mainstreaming biodiversity in agriculture. Yesterday's global dialogue reinforced the critical role biodiversity plays in agricultural sectors. It is clear that interministerial coordination will be needed to ensure food system po systems policies are coherent and complementarity. Policies and investments that promote agroecological, integrated, diversified approaches in farms, fisheries, and forests, and those that minimize trade-offs between environmental quality and food production are necessary if we are to reach our 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. In this regard, I would like to highlight four issues where your views and your insights will be critical to help us develop a robust post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Number one, we know that 84% of the world's farms are operated by smallholders and that small farms on average have higher yields and have a greater biodiversity. Yet, smallholders dis disproportionately face the brunt of environmental degradation and lack access to formal safety nets. How can the framework then support smallholders in their dual role as producers and stewards of biodiversity while incentivizing large scale producers to shift towards more sustainable practices? Two, 
more than 1.3 billion people live on degraded agricultural land with limited fertility. The misuse of chemicals inputs and unsustainable soil management practices contribute to soil degradation and soil biodiversity loss, requiring farmers to depend further on chemical inputs, creating a vicious circle. How then can we better articulate the links between Convention on Biological Diversity's Plan of Action on Soil Biodiversity and the monitoring framework of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework to effectively address the drivers of soil biodiversity loss. <clears throat> Three, we know that the diversity of cultivated species is declining at an unsustainable rate. Everywhere in the world, people are not consuming enough nutrient-rich foods and are missing the full range of nutrients essential to human health. Furthermore, the COVID-19 pandemic might have pushed additional 83 to 132 million people into chronic hunger in 2020. We need to ensure that all goals and targets of the framework promote agrobiodiversity, both in our diets and in the production landscapes. Fourthly and lastly, demand for fish has more than doubled globally since 1990, resulting in an increase in the percentage of overfished stocks. Yet, there is evidence that properly managed fisheries and aquaculture systems can indeed maintain fish stocks in biological sustainable levels. What goals and targets for fisheries and aquaculture are key to include then in the global biodiversity framework? Although these issues may seem daunting, we have a roadmap. The fifth global biodiversity outlook which examine the progress made so far in achieving the Aichi biodiversity targets, looks at the future and examined, examines the promise, progress, and prospects of eight interdependent transitions on key issues that collectively can move our societies into a more sustainable coexistence with nature. Two of them are notable for our discussions here today. First, the sustainable agricultural transition suggests redesigning agricultural systems through agroecological and other innovative approaches to enhance productivity while minimizing negative impacts on biodiversity. And second, the sustainable food systems transition promotes sustainable and healthy diets with a greater emphasis on the diversity of foods and more moderate consumption of meat and fish, as well as the dramatic cuts in the waste involved in food supply and consumption. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me highlight again the importance of this event as we prepare for our conference of the parties 15. The efforts advocate for multi-stakeholder, inclusive collaboration, integrated policy making and systems based approaches will be critical to achieve the transformation we are all seeking to achieve in this regard i wish you a successful segment and i look forward to hearing the recommendations that will emanate from these important discussions as we move forward to further develop the global the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Thank you very much. Back to you, Maria Elena. Thank you very much, uh, Executive Secretary. I think you put us pertinent questions that they will help frame today's discussion as we look ahead to the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. You call our attention that we need a multi-stakeholder inclusive collaboration we need an interministerial coordination and we need a systemic approach. Ladies and gentlemen, now, before we hear from today's keynote speaker, I wish to invite you to our cultural note. 
It is my immense pleasure to introduce Mrs. He Gue, award famous opera soprano, particularly recognized for her moving performance of the great Italian composers Puccini and Verdi. Mr. He has prepared a special video for us. Please share the video with us. Hu 演员、歌唱家和企业演奏家长笛手可能在演奏一个音符这就像歌剧中的元素一样让我来邀请您一起来聆听一段我演唱的歌剧片段Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause for this inspiring moment that literally sets a new tone for our event. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Shakuntala Tilstead, the 2021 World Food Prize Laureate for her, her groundbreaking research, critical insights and landmark innovation in developing holistic, nutrition sensitive approach to aquatic food system, including fisheries and aquaculture. She is a global lead for nutrition and public, public health at World Fish. Mr. Tilstead, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. For joining. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to address the participants of this platform. Often, discourses on food and agriculture are not aligned to bio, biodiversity and ecological conservation. A common viewpoint is that with growth in food and agriculture, environmental degradation and biodiversity loss occur. Today, 
I will use this platform to discuss this viewpoint through presenting solutions that position protection and improvement in biodiversity within food systems transformation. Next slide, please. 2021 is a very challenging year for all of us. Some of us are recovering from the 2020 lockdowns caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, while others are still suffering from waves of new infections. This protracted dis disruption exposed us to several inconvenient truths, including the fragility of our current food system, and also the ability of our environment to heal when there is no human interference. We have heard narratives of local flora and fauna reclaiming spaces that were once their homes. And at the same time, we know that people, especially the poor and vulnerable, are exposed to greater risks of hunger and malnutrition. Later this year, the global community will come together in the United Nations Food Systems Summit to discuss people-led solutions to transform our food, land, and water systems, both terrestrial and aquatic food systems. This is the opportune time to position the importance of bioconservation within the... Next slide, please. Based on an FAO report, we know that out of several hundred thousands varieties of plants, about 120 varieties are cultivated for human consumption, and just 9% of the global agricultural production. Similarly, global aquatic food consumption is limited to a few well-known species, such as salmon, carps, tilapia, and catfish, while a wide diverse range of other aquatic foods go unrecognized for their food and nutrition value. As shown in this WWF paper published this year, and also in the Illuminating Hidden Harvest, a collaboration study led by FAO, Duke University, and Worldfish, we know that we should be making better use of the diverse range of aquatic foods. The poor management of food diversity and resources is a major cause of concern, as exemplified throughout our history. For example, the Great Famine in Ireland in the 19th century, the Great Chinese Famine in the 20th century, and now the Panama disease that threatens the global banana production. A focus on limited varieties and species, mismanagement of resources, and destruction of habitats have also threatened aquatic food systems, such as the collapse of the Northwest cod fishery, the collapse of wild seaweed industry in Tanzania, and the uncontrolled destruction of aquatic breeding grounds, such as seagrass beds, mango forests, and coral reefs. Next slide, please. I will use aquatic food systems to illustrate my messages. However, the concepts that I present are if applicable across terrestrial food systems. My first message is that we need to look beyond our usual diets and increase the diversity of foods on our plates. Instead of consuming, for example, only salmon or tuna, we should make available and accessible other types of fish and also other aquatic foods, such as small pelagic fish species, bivalves, mollusks and seaweeds, 
and also plants and microorganisms. Low trophic, high biomass aquatic foods provide multiple benefits across the food systems. The consumption increases the intake of multiple micronutrients and essential fatty acids, especially in poor and marginalized population groups. The use of low trophic species takes the pressure off the capture of large species and the need to intensive aquaculture practices to produce a few large species of fish. We must also improve consumer awareness and demand for such foods by introducing culturally acceptable, easily available, nutritious and safe aquatic food products into the markets. For example, we have seen how fish chutney and fish powder made from dried small fish and introduced in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Malawi, and Zambia have increased the demand of diverse small, small fish sheets. Next slide, please. To transform food systems, we must understand and the synergies between land and water systems and develop management interventions that enable food production and at the same time protect biodiversity and ecological resources. In introducing pond polyculture in Bangladesh, I pushed for the ban of pesticide use to clean the pond before the stocking of fingerlings. I further pushed for the inclusion of small indigenous fish species within the pond they occupy different niches within the pond and increase production and productivity, as well as the nutritional quality of the whole system. This approach is now adopted by the government of Bangladesh and is being implemented across the country, which has 4 million homestead ponds. This approach also led to a better recognition recognition of the benefits of small indigenous fish species and the need for their preservation. The Department of Fisheries has identified about 140 small fish species for conservation and introduced policies to protect their breeding grounds. Another example of integrated management of resources is the use of community fish refuge in rice field fisheries in Cambodia. These refuge serve as sanctuaries for fish and other aquatic species during the dry season. And then they return to the rice fields during the wet season. Next slide, please. Food producers in the past were close to the environments and with use of traditional knowledge and practices obtain food while ensuring that the resources are not depleted. Use of organic waste from livestock as fertilizers, crop rotation, staggered production cycles, and the use of natural pest control are examples of these. Replacement of these practices and knowledge with modern technologies, such as the rampant use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, intensive monoculture, and fixed production cycles have led to undesired consequences. These are, for example, leaching of inorganic materials into soil and waters, decimation of local biodiversity, an increased risk of antimicrobial resistance within the systems. Therefore, it is imperative for us to bridge traditional knowledge and practices with modern day solutions and strategies in order to find ways that can improve food production while reducing the risks to our environment. Indigenous peoples, women and youth must be included in developing these solutions 
and must be empowered to make this transformation of our food systems. Next slide, please. With less than 10 years to realize, realize the goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we must work together and across disciplines to ensure that our solutions and strategies for transformation are holistic and within the boundaries of our planetary head. We must always heed that food and nutrition security is dependent on biodiversity and environmental health and vice versa. As we transition towards a food systems transformation, the guiding principles behind the mission and vision of the global biodiversity framework should be clearly articulated and incorporated in the solutions and strategies proposed, as well as on their implementation, monitoring and scaling beyond 2021 and 2030. The time is now for all of us to take action. In doing so, we will benefit our people, our future generations and our planet. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, reminding us again that uh, we must work together. We need action. We must work across disciplines with a holistic approach and between the planet boundaries. Now, it's my pleasure to turn to our second keynote speaker, Mrs. Bibi Amina Gurib Fakim. She is former president of Mauritius and a renowned biodiversity scientist. Prior to join the State House, Mrs. Gurib Fakim has been the managing director of the Le Centre d'International de Développement Pharmaceutique, Research and Innovation, as well as professor of organic chemistry with an endowed chair at the University of Mauritius. Madame Gurib Fakim, vous avez la parole. Merci. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madame DDG. It's a great pleasure to see you again. Um, excellencies, distinguished participants, fellow scientists, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I would like upfront to thank the Director General of the FAO, Honorable Chu Don Yu, for associating me with this very important event. Ladies and gentlemen, June 2021 marked the launch of UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. As a human race, we must spare no effort to make this decade on ecosystem restoration a success because preserving nature and maintaining its services are critical for our survival on this planet and for our economies. Unfortunately, the World Bank is already forecasting that in Sub-Saharan Africa, the collapse of ecosystem services will imply the contraction of GDP by 9.7% annually by 2030. This unfortunate statement dovetails with what Professor Das Gupta has said in his seminal work on the economics of biodiversity, and I quote, humanity now faces a choice. We can continue down a path where our demands on nature far exceed its capacity to, to meet them on a sustainable basis, or we can take a different path, one where our engagements with nature are not only sustainable, but also enhance our collective well-being and that of our descendants, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, how did we get there? At the heart of the problem lies deep-rooted, widespread institutional failure. Every single year, we lose ecosystem services worth more than 10% of our global economic output. As we speak, one third of the world's farmland is degraded and about 87% of inland wetlands worldwide have disappeared since the 1700, and one third of commercial fish species are overexploited, and one million species are threatened with extinction. Degradation is already affecting the well being of an estimated 3.2 billion people, 
that is 40% of the world's population. Ecosystem restoration is needed on a large scale as it delivers on multiple benefits and help us deliver on the sustainable development agenda. Restoration also curbs the risk of mass species extinctions and future pandemics. To begin with, ladies and gentlemen, we need to start with the restoration of forest landscapes, farming, livestock, and fish producing ecosystem and bring them to a healthy and stable state. Reviving ecosystems and other natural solutions could contribute over a third of the total climate mitigation needed by 2030. For this effort to be sustained on a global scale, institutions require sustained investment as there is growing evidence that it is more than, pay, than pays for itself. Policymakers and financial institutions are only slowly realizing the huge need and potential for green investment. Countries like Costa Rica has seen ecotourism grow to account for 6% of GDP by doubling its forest cover. By 2030, Mesoamerica and Indonesia could add 2.5 billion US dollars to their economy simply by restoring coral reefs. A restored population of marine fish can deliver a maximum sustainable yield that could increase fisheries production by 16.5 million tons, an annual value of 32 billion US dollars. Agroforestry revival alone could increase food security for 1.3 billion people. Ladies and gentlemen, actions that prevent, halt, and reverse degradation are needed if we are to keep global temperature below two degrees centigrade. This could involve action to better manage some 2.5 billion hectares of forest, crop, and grazing land through restoration and avoiding degradation, and restoration of natural cover over 230 million hectares. Large-scale investments in dryland agriculture, mangrove protection, water management will make a vital contribution to building resilience to climate change, generating benefits around four times the original investment. With careful planning, restoring 15% of converted lands while stopping further conversion of natural ecosystems could avoid 60% of expected species extinctions. Achieving successful ecosystem restoration at scale will require deep changes, including the adoption of inclusive wealth as a more accurate measure of economic progress. This will rest on the widespread introduction of natural capital, accounting thus creating an enabling environment for private sector investment, including public-private partnership. Progress can be made by increasing finance for restoration, including the elimination of perverse subsidies that incentivize further degradation and fuel climate change. Such initiatives must be accompanied by raising awareness on the risk posed by ecosystem degradation. Transformation will happen when we start reforming agriculture, by changing how we build our cities, by decarbonizing our economies, and by moving to circular economic models. Degradation is undermining our hard-won development gains and is threatening the well-being of today's youth and future generations, while making national commitments increasingly more difficult and costly to reach. None of the agreed global goals for the protection of life on earth and for halting the degradation of land and ocean have been fully met. UNEP reports 2021 reports that six out of the 20 HE biodiversity targets have been partially achieved. Ecosystem restoration alone cannot solve the crisis we face, but it is key to avoiding the worst of them. It is becoming clearer and clearer that we have to recreate a balanced relationship with nature, not only by conserving ecosystems that are still healthy, but also by urgently and sustainably restoring degraded ones. For too long, ladies and gentlemen, we have been using the planet as a sink 
for our waste products, such as carbon dioxide, plastics, and other forms of waste, including pollution. We need to change how we think, act, and measure success as transformative change is possible because we and our descendants deserve nothing less. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Madam uh, Amina Gurib Fakim. Very good to see you again. Thank you for uh, joining us and thank you for highlighting the critical importance of ecosystem restoration, emphasizing that there is no time to wait and we need to, we need to change how we think and how we act and connect with nature. Also reminding us that we, we need an enabling environment for private sector and public-private partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our remarkable speakers before handing over to the co-chairs who will present the interim report on the outcomes of the global dialogue happen, uh, taking took place yesterday. Dear co-chairs, over to you. Uh, who will start? Ambassador Tenawat? Hello? Uh, good morning. Yeah. Okay, and Ambassador, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Maria, and uh, good morning. Uh, on behalf of the fellow co-chair ambassadors, I have the honor to um, present a summary of the discussion. Uh, if I may just indicate that this is a, 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 a recap, sorry, of yesterday's session. And uh, certainly uh, we had presented it at the end of the session, but uh, there's been further refinements. So I will not read all the details uh, in the report, but I wish to remind you that the global dialogue is a follow-up of the multi-stakeholder dialogue on biodiversity mainstreaming across agricultural sectors, which uh, was co-organized by the FAO and the uh, CBD Secretariat in 2018. In this super year for nature, the global dialogue has been convened to deliberate on the role of the food and agricultural sectors as part of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. The meeting report and uh, our co-chairs report will be brought to the attention of the UN Food Systems Summit and the CBD processes in the lead up to COP15, a conference of parties uh, in Kunming in China. And we opened uh, the global a dialogue yesterday, uh, and it was opened by our, our FIO Director General and the Executive Secretary of the CBD. We heard from the 18 distinguished speakers on the first day, including leaders and champions of biodiversity in policy and science, representing a wide range of stakeholder groups and world regions, and working across crops, uh, livestock, forestry, and fisheries sectors. Some uh, of the participants uh, also uh, pa uh, made their inputs. Uh, we had about 1,200 particip participants that were registered on this platform uh, who were participating uh, virtually. Uh, the first session of the dialogue focused on, the meeting, on meeting people's needs through the sustainable use of biodiversity, highlighting the indivisible link between people and nature and the significant uh, contributions of indigenous uh, peoples and family farmers uh, to the sustainable management of ecosystems and biodiversity. On the sec during the second session, uh, which was focusing on mainstreaming biodiversity for better production, better nutrition, and a better environment and for a better life. We discussed this, the different topics uh, and aspects of which related to sustainable management, restoration of biodiversity across uh, the various crops, uh, including the sectors, uh, fisheries sectors and forestry, as I already mentioned. In summary, in terms of the key messages, 
uh, we had uh, one, we have grouped the key messages in terms of the clusters of the topics that were handled yesterday. Uh, we had a topic on human rights, depending on a healthy biosphere. In this respect, uh, our focus uh, was on the rights of indigenous people, local communities, women and family farmers. And this uh, focus was recognizing the rights that we should be protecting and make sure that there are various um, 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 uh, applications that would uphold sustainable uh, biodiversity conservation and use uh, in respect of the various uh, uh, species or even crops. Uh, we focused on empowerment and increasing agency of uh, small farmers, uh, which was seen to be critical in respect of um, making sure that there's ownership in, and, uh, and as we deal with the climate challenges, uh, when we talk about alternative means of production, um, uh, the communities would be empowered sufficiently to do what is good for nature. Uh, in respect of the value of, the, um, of understanding indigenous peoples, uh, the message that is coming across is that we need to maintain a strong connection to the environment through hunting, herding, fishing, and gathering renewable resources. And small scale producers who primarily rely on biodiversity for their food security and livelihoods, which are disproportionately impacted by the erosion of the biodiversity. We also have a key message in respect of food and agriculture systems, uh, in particular the emphasis on conserving, conserving biodiversity and reducing habitat destruction, uh, which also minimizes the risk of spillover of pathogens and exposure to humans. Again, this is a, an a message about protecting effectively uh, the biodiversity, whilst uh, we acknowledge the reliance of um, a, a, a people and a society uh, in, in terms of their livelihood uh, on uh, natural resources. Um, there were concerns that were uh, raised by the various participants and organ presenters, which related to the impact of livestock production on biodiversity and climate. Again, this was linking the ecosystem loss and degradation, um, increasing the risk of uh, zoonotic, uh, zoonotic spillover, which uh, effect uh, would also arise, uh, 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 arise in heating of the planet. Uh, that undermines productivity. Again, the scientists underscored this aspect. At the same time, our food systems and diets are a driver for 80% of human diseases. And this again uh, was uh, 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 taken from the Leonard Fairbrook. On the consumption side, uh, the importance of shifting diets towards healthy, sustainable, and less waste wasteful alternatives that provide win-win solutions uh, in some countries, this may imply a reduction in the consumption of livestock products. In other contexts, including the small-scale farmers and pastoral, uh, pastoralists, uh, animal production and cons consumption makes an essential contribution to livelihoods, nutrition, and climate resilience. We need, to, we need collective action to build the balance. Again, this is why I think the roundtable uh, yesterday uh, emphasize the link to what we position as a message uh, from coming out of this uh, dialogue. For COP15, uh, which is the CBD uh, Conference of Parties, uh, Climate Change Conference of Parties, COP26, and the Food Systems Summit, uh, which is a UN uh, summit um, in the context of uh, nutrition for growth uh, and, uh, and messaging, uh, where we also commit that uh, nutrition for growth can all help. So these are the key messages that are coming out of the session. And lastly, if I go to item six of uh, the discussions that we held yesterday, uh, focusing on sustainable solutions and biodiversity friendly practices existing around the world to all in all sectors uh, and along with the key value chains. Um, the key message in this respect uh, outlined or underlined that there is scope for innovation, but there needs to be a market for products that respond to biodiversity and climate challenges. 
reducing food loss and waste uh, is one other key aspect. And uh, again, um, um, the, the, the inputs uh, also uh, focused on solutions that are needed to be tailored for local and regional circumstances. Um, lastly, again, before I hand over to, my, to one of my coaches, uh, I would like to uh, reflect on um, key messages related to uh, integrated planning. Here, there is also um, a, an acknowledgement uh, that for us to have an improvement on farm practices, uh, we need uh, partnerships that bring together all actors within a landscape to maintain and restore ecological networks with solutions anchored in local practices. Is, um, and there were proposals or suggestions around spatial planning to make sure land uses have posit uh, positive ecological and economic impacts. Again, valuing uh, natural resources uh, uh, in a manner that would enable uh, uh, the recognition uh, for protection and conservation for future generations. Um, on the transformative interventions to scale up biodiversity production systems, policies and markets are needed to support a transition to a more biodiverse production, including a push and pull factors. Uh, there are suggestions on incentives, payments for ecosystem services, uh, how uh, we can also benefit from public uh, procurement and linking sustainable grown products to markets, uh, including special uh, crops and, uh, and that could uh, increase uh, household incomes. On knowledge and research, again, the key here was the importance of a diversification of knowledge and making sure that uh, uh, there are innovative ways in which uh, knowledge is shared and, uh, uh, and, and available uh, for communities and smallholder farmers, uh, including uh, some of the established agro uh, businesses. Uh, in this would assist in terms of improving production systems from a knowledge intensive basis. On the financing as a key lever, uh, a scale of investment uh, that is required to transform landscapes, um, which uh, begins to uh, limit the disjointedness in respect of investments was uh, underscored uh, and that there are uh, hidden costs of biodiversity loss and a degradation and visibility within the context of food systems. We need metrics to measure biodiversity and monitor progress. And uh, I, I would like to conclude, uh, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, hand over to my co-chairs if they want to make further additions. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ngakaba, for sharing uh, this. Uh, synthesis of yesterday's session. I don't know if Ambassador Tanawat would like to complement. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, Semedo. I think it's my uh, co-chair uh, ambassadors uh, cover all the issues that we discussed yesterday. But uh, one of the issues that we would like to strengthen uh, as well, and also yesterday I already mentioned that uh, securing um, uh, the biodiversity is uh, the responsibility for each of us. And we need to take the action now and, and your commitment and contribution to, uh, to this uh, uh, for uh, conservation and uh, sustainable use of our diversities is crucial. And also I would like to take these opportunities as the chairperson of the, the Committee on World Food Security CFS. We would like to address uh, to uh, all of you that uh, the voluntary guideline on food system and nutrition and also the recently uh, endorsed uh, policy recommendation on agroecological and other innovative approach, which the chairpersons of the open-ended working group on voluntary guideline on food system and nutrition, Ambassador Hans Hogevin, and also the uh, rapporteur of the policy recommendation on agroecology and other innovative approach, uh, Ambassador Yaya Olani Lanz is here. Uh, both are policy products. 
also as address the issues on biodiversity is a crucial. And that's why now is the time for the members and other stakeholders uh, to take a look on those uh, policy recommendations and translate uh, the global policies into action at the country level if we want to have the better outcome for better futures for our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our co-chairs for sharing with us this uh, synthesis which will help shape and enrich the discussion for the rest of the day. Uh, let me recognize the presence of Ambassador Hans Hogabin, the independent chairperson of the Council. He has been with us since yesterday. Thank you uh, for joining us. And, and now I will hand over to Kent Nadozi, the Secretary of International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, and Irene Hoffman, the Secretary of the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture who will facilitate this morning panel discussion on the status of development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Colleagues, over to you. Kent, over to you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, uh, DDG, Madam Senedo, for, for, for this opportunity and for your management of, of the process so far. Excellencies, distinguished ambassadors and guests, Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for staying with us as we continue with today's program. Uh, my name is Kent Nadoze. I'm the Secretary of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. With me this morning to facilitate this segment is my colleague, Ms. Irene Hoffman. And it is our honor to be here to moderate the proceedings, as well as the briefing by the co-chairs of the open-ended working group that is negotiating the global biodiversity framework and that will be followed by a panel discussion as well so let me start uh, by extending the sincere gratitude of fao to the co-chairs of the open-ended working group on the post 2020 global biodiversity framework mr francis ogwal and mr basil von Harre, for agreeing to join us today at this event uh, as you are all aware the negotiations are currently ongoing within the CBD for the development of this framework, and which is uh, expected to be considered and adopted during the 15th meeting of the Conference of Parties to the Convention. Uh, FAO's continued engagement in this process has been critical in raising awareness and highlighting the role of biodiversity for food security and nutrition, and the contribution of the agricultural sectors to the sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity. Uh, it was in this context that FAO was pleased to host the second meeting of the open-ended working group uh, that um, took place in Rome from 24 to 29 February 2020, just before the pandemic shutdown hit. It was also in this context that it's also in this context that we are here today, organizing this briefing session during the global dialogue as part of our overall engagement and commitment towards supporting and facilitating a positive outcome for these important negotiations. So we are therefore very pleased to welcome the co-chairs of the working group who have kindly agreed to update us on the status of the negotiations and on the next steps in the process towards the adoption of the framework. So Basil and Francis, thank you very much. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> My name is Basil Van Aven. I'm very pleased to join you. I understand Francis is also online. I will be sharing my screen in a moment and, and start the presentation. And then Francis will be, uh, will be uh, following me in the presentation. We'll, we'll take turns in, uh, in uh, uh, delivering this presentation. So, uh, Perhaps uh, Kent can give me a hand signals when he sees that uh, the presentation shows on the screens. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So um, basically we want to give you a brief and, um, and uh, you will see on this brief that we wanna talk a little bit about the urgency to act and probably something uh, you heard yesterday. I was, I was very pleased to hear the summary. We want to talk about what we're trying to do with the framework and the notion this is a framework for all. 
We'll get into some detail about the, the framework, the goals and the target. And then uh, we want to come back with a couple of points of particular interest. Um, and those are this uh, notion of how do we work on productivity and sustainability at the same time and why this is good for, for the environment and why this is good for conservation. And then finally, the agri-food and associated system transition, which is kind of a daunting challenge that we, we all face. Um, on, uh, on this slide, you see a, a, a screen capture from the uh, International Panel on Bio Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service Assessment, which is the base for our work. And then really uh, the, the panel has identified, and you can see that as the, at the bottom of the screen, that the, the five or six, uh, five major drivers of biodiversity loss is land use and sea use change direct exploitation, climate change, pollution, and invasive species. And you will see when Francis presents the targets <clears throat> that we're trying to address directly those drivers. Um, we can contribute to a number of the indirect drivers, particularly in terms of values and behaviors, but some others are outside of the scope of our convention and uh, better integrated under the sustainable development agenda. But what that, uh, that mean in terms is business as usual, we're gonna see biodiversity loss increasing. And we're gonna see loss of natural ecosystem, deplet depletion of fish stock, climate change that will go over the two degrees, risk of invasive alien species increasing from between three and 20, and 20 time, and then plastic waste increasing 2.6 uh, time. So, really a very strong signal and and this time is the opportunity to bend the curve or change the system so an urgency to to act and i've talked about the biological factor and and i want to talk very briefly uh, about the the economic the economists are telling us that about a third of our global economy is depending on nat on nature and and i'm not going to tell you how important biodiversity is to the, the business of the FAO, that is pretty evident. What we also see is the previous set of targets were not fully met. Some uh, were, were met, but not all. And there was deficiencies in the way we've been doing accountability in terms of planning, reporting, and review. So um, basically, this is the last chance to put the system back on track, and, and we're, we're, we're embarking on a way and a very fundamental overall of the system. You will see that we're not only looking at the action to 2030, but we also are looking at how we transform that vision for 2050 into something that is measurable. Um, the parties to the convention give us a, a, a charter with a number of, uh, of uh, principle. I am not going to go through the list in the middle box there but a few that are really important to us and to, to the parties and to the convention is that notion of a participatory and inclusive process. So definitely one of the, the diagnostic made was that the last framework was seen as within the purview of environment ministers. And that has not worked. What we need is a framework for all, a framework that engaged not only the environment minister, but also the Ministry for Agriculture, for Fishery, your organization, as well as, uh, as uh, many, many others. So um, we, we're gonna try to adopt a language that is uh, generic and, and understandable and used for all. And we're going to try to build an open performance system that will be enabling other organizations to, to build or attach their existing system to it. Um, I forgot to mention the, the, in the middle on the left side, the notion of realistic yet ambitious targets. I think one of the other diagnostic of the previous system is that, uh, that there was a, a, those aspirational targets or de facto meaning that some would not be reached and that's, that's create uh, some problem with communication. So the framework itself uh, is, uh, you'll see here a, a graphical representation, what we call the theory of change. And uh, you read it from, from the right back to the left and you on the right most, you see the vision living in harmony with nature, which everybody agrees to, and that is not for negotiation. 
What is for negotiation is how we translate that uh, vision into goals that are measurable for 2050. So how are we gonna know that we reach the, the, the outcome? The, the, the second point is, is that we're gonna be translating those into milestone and, and those will be measurable in 2030. Uh, the larger gray box is the action target box and you'll see uh, targets that are addressing directly uh, reducing the threats identified by IBES. But also, and that's a very important point that was very clearly told, told to us by many, many, that they want, people want a balancing of the three objectives of the convention. Everybody knows about the conservation objective. What is probably less known, and I was very pleased to hear it in the, in the summary by the, the co-chair, is that there is also a need to talk about how biodiversity help meet people needs and how we share equitably the outcome of the biodiversity. That is all supported by a number of tools solution, which in turn are supported by enabling condition needs of implementation and a system of responsibility and transparency. So Francis, this is, I think, where uh, you will be taking over for a few slides. So I'll be pleased to turn the slide for you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, co-chair. Uh, we'll try to go on with the next slides and then we can end it there. So what we have tried to demonstrate here, and we had this a lot during the consultations, we have had regional consultations, we have consulted different uh, groups of stakeholders, but um, there was this very strong view and um, advice that we should be able to link the post 2020 to the SDGs. And so just building on from what my co-chair has said, this is where you try to see us trying to link the post 2020 itself to the SDGs. So what you can see here clearly is that actually biodiversity is so critical. If we are going to uh, achieve the SDGs, the status of biodiversity, how biodiversity is going to be now and in the future if the degradation continues. You do expect that perhaps um, even the SDGs achievement of the SDGs is going to be continuously undermined. So you, you basically see, we try to link um, those different uh, SDGs and um, to the framework, including of course, pointing out that uh, if we implement the framework holistically, we should see the SDGs better being achieved. But if the framework is not implemented when adopted, we would really expect that we are still going to continuously see um, where SDGs perhaps are being pursued um, independently and also the issues of environment or biodiversity also being pursued independently. And the two will always um, not be achieved well. They need to complement each other, especially biodiversity conservation in this case. So that is just to give you that broad picture of what we are thinking in terms of creating that linkage, as you see it in that uh, diagram, which we have illustrated there. So we can um, go on to the next slide. Now I will dwell a little bit here. And um, just to tell you that those green areas would point out to really what we think could be the contribution of the work you do or how it is linked to the framework. You look, we have got four goals. We've got 20 action targets. Now, if you just first of all look at it, just in terms of the green colors, I think food system or food production is everywhere. Your work is everywhere. Even the target 10, uh, 11, 18, still you're there. So basically the work you do is so, so important to the future of biodiversity because we are talking of a world which is currently at about maybe 7.5 to 7.7 .7 billion people. And um, in the next so many years by 2050, maybe we shall be about 10 billion, 2100, it could be about 12 billion. Now that tells us space is going to remain more people have to be fed. 
more food production is needed. So what is the fate of biodiversity as these scenarios of population growth continues? So that is why <clears throat> looking at food systems, it becomes so important for us in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So there are four targets, uh, sorry, four or 2050 goals, as you see them on your extreme right there. And the goal one basically is dealing with the area connectivity, integrity of natural ecosystem, which we would like it to increase by a certain percentage by 2050. But also in that goal, we emphasize that we like to see a more healthy and resilient population of all species. We are talking of all species and also reducing the number of those species that are actually threatened. That is goal A. Goal B, this is where we are talking about what do we get from nature contribution of nature to people. And so we should be able to have valued, maintained or enhanced uh, the conservation and sustainable use of those systems that are very important for us to really continue getting benefits from nature. Then the third one deals with the benefits, benefit sharing, and here that they should be equally or uh, fairly shared by that time. In fact, beginning immediately, maybe even now, and then the other goal D deals with it, <coughs> the means of implementation, a framework which is not going to be implemented, as my coach, I will always tell you, it is only a piece of paper and can gather dust, yet a lot of effort will have gone into putting it in place. So we need to resource uh, the framework itself so that we see what we expect it to bring into the world. Now, of course, then you go to the action targets, which as Coach has said, we've grouped them into three. You find there is action targets that deal with reducing threats to biodiversity, the one that deals with meeting needs of people, and then the tools and solution. So all these will should be able to deliver us to those goals eventually, if they are all carried out well. So target one on reducing um, uh, threats basically deals with the, the area that is globally you're looking at the land and the sea areas globally and as spatial planning, that's what we want to see. But also we should be able to address land use change. And in this particular target also, we are talking about restoration that at a certain time, we need a certain percentage by 2030, certain percentage of the area, degraded area restored. And uh, I had restoration being emphasized here, that is being taken care of in the targets themselves. Then target to this will basically protected area system. You know that these are very important uh, conservation areas and perhaps the last refugia that we can have if we are going to have the world better uh, guaranteed with what you have. And um, so we are saying that by 2030, we should be able to conserve those areas, protected areas that should be well connected uh, through proper corrected, connected protected area system that should be properly managed and also, we also talk here about the other area-based conservation measures that they should be there. But um, this is also a target that this with the 30 by 30, you've heard about that, that we want at least the global land areas, whether sea or land, or should be at least 30% of that should be under protection. Then target three deals with species. And we've heard a lot of people have talked about species and their importance, and therefore this target mainly deals with the, an effort to actively manage and enable wild species of flora and fauna to recover. We know we are losing a lot of them. And the agricultural sector, as you know, where it takes place, most of you might be aware of that. There could be loss of species happening because of converting a certain area of land to agriculture. Now, how do we bring in these two to be in harmony? Then the target hold is with the sustainable harvesting and trade that this should be within uh, safe limits, should be what should not be a threat to species survival. We're talking about invasive alien species, and most of this comes through agriculture, as you could be knowing, but also through other sources. And then It would seem that uh, Francis has uh, some technical problems. 
perhaps uh, Basil might uh, continue. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be happy to uh, to uh, take over when, until Francis reconnect. So uh, Francis was talking about the targets, and I'll I'll pick up where from where he is. Target number six is around pollution, and the uh, the proposal is to focus on the three top uh, substances as identified by IPBES. And you will see that they are directly relevant to your business. Uh, we're talking about pesticide, nutrients, and plastic waste. Target seven on climate change will undoubtedly be the, the, the subject of long discussion because there is kind of a dual uh, aspect to it. There is This is as much about the impact of climate change on uh, on uh, on the uh, biodiversity and what we can do for that, which is about the contribution that uh, nature can provide to mitigation adaptation efforts. But it's it is also about ensuring that other efforts are not damaging to agriculture, um, as you as you know uh, the notion of crop for energy has been creating a number of challenges on the biodiversity side. Moving to the, the block below on meeting people needs is one <clears throat> that is probably should have been kind of in a brighter or darker shade of, of green. Um, the use of species, including, including fishery in meeting people need, as well as the use of space with agriculture, forestry and aquaculture are also uh, meeting people need. Under number 10, we're capturing all other regulating service and provision service as identified by IPES, including uh, the role of nature in nature-based solution in the, in the provision of water. Number 11 is about health and the culture with a focus on the access uh, of urban dwellers to green and blue space. 12 is around the sharing of the benefit and making sure that we are putting in place the obligation of related to the benefit sharing under the convention. And the block from 13 to 20 is very important. It talks about the condition and number 13 is mainstreaming in policy, planning and regulation by diversity. And that is obviously including uh, the decision made by colleagues in the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fishery. It includes also the notion of environmental impact assessment. 14 is more focused on production and supply chain and the role that uh, the economic sector managed by private hands is playing in the system and how we can integrate into those decisions. And that is progressing at a very rapid pace. 15 is focusing on individual choice and what consumer, all of us, uh, are making choice every day in our life. When we buy a cup of coffee, when uh, when uh, we decide to go on a, on a vacation and, and how we can make sure that those choices are sustainable. Number 16 is talking about the biosafety and then ensuring that the potential negative effect of uh, biotechnology are addressed. 17 is extremely important. Uh, we, we know that there is a vast amount of resources uh, that is currently working against biodiversity interest and, and reform and repurposing of negative incentive, uh, particularly in the area of uh, fishery, forestry and agriculture could lead to large scale decrease in cost of remediation and restoration. This target 17 cannot exist without the, uh, the matching targets around resource mobilization and capacity building. There is definitely a need to improve, increase the resource with a particular focus on ensuring that the obligation uh, related to the resource for developing countries are met. 19, around available information, including traditional knowledge, and then finally, uh, the role of indigenous people and local community, which is extremely important to all of those targets, particularly target one and two, women and girls and youth. All that is done within a context where we're going to need uh, some enabling condition, including political will, uh, participative governance, but also very clearly we had a message for a stronger uh, framework for planning, reporting, monitoring and review, and, and we are working hard on that. So um, I, I will be turning to the next slide, but want to check first if uh, Francis is able to, uh, uh, to continue. Francis, are you back with us? Yes, yes, sorry, I, the network just went off here. 
Yes, so um, I think the next few slides, we shall try now to tell you what are our next steps um, as far as work on the framework is concerned, um, is to have draft one of the post 2020 framework itself uh, published by 12th July. We are on course on that. And basically that is going to happen. We know we are going to meet that target. And then we are going to have the third meeting of the working group, the first one, of course, we are going to have it virtually because of the prevailing circumstances now, which we all know. That will run for two weeks from 23rd uh, August to 3rd September, not far from now. And then we could have the follow-up phases of these meetings, especially the face-to-face, -to, -face, to finally do the negotiation on, 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 on this um, framework. We know that the virtual meeting may not give us all the opportunity to do the full negotiations, but there will be some element of it uh, during the virtual meeting, but basically the full negotiation should happen in the physical meeting. And then, of course, then this could be taken to the conference of the parties. All these, the dates are yet to be confirmed, the physical meetings, because of the circumstances we all know now. Um, could you go to the next? Next slide, go chair. Yeah, so this slide here tries to, I think, still point out what we are talking earlier mm -hmm. about what um, we could do perhaps to protect nature better um, as we not only try to meet our human needs, but also become more responsible towards nature. So we're saying here that we need to be avoiding negative impacts on biodiversity and food security. Uh, we know this is an important area, but we need to be avoiding those negative impacts as much as we can. Then we are, of course, saying here that the nature-based solution is going to be very important, including the ecosystem-based approaches for us to really take care of Mother Nature better. And then we should be able to mainstream, promote, and implement sustainable management practices, and especially in the agricultural sector. Agriculture is not going to be one that we would say if you can put it all for because people have to be fed. Everybody has to be fed and fed well, including having those nutritious food that we need. But we need to be seeing how you do that. Then how well, in the next, uh, as you, on the right there, you see we are trying to say how nature really contributes um, to our own well-being. And um, I think the important thing here is that we have traditional knowledge for which we can depend on. We have the genetic resources, but also we need these components of biodiversity to be used sustainably. We need to be enhancing the food security, nutrition, as well as livelihoods. I talked about that. But above all, we need to be safeguarding biodiversity for food security. Someone one time was saying that we protect biodiversity just because we benefit from it. I remember him during, I think, the second meeting of SBI, he said we are not protecting biodiversity just for the sake of it. It is because we benefit from it. So if we know we benefit from biodiversity, we should do all we can to make sure that those services it provides continue to flow. And then the benefits arising from those utilization of genetic resources should be shared fairly and equally. Next slide. Francis, do you want me to take over this part? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Francis. So let me continue with a, a couple ideas and concepts. And, and here is one. How do we balance and, and, and should we balance uh, productivity and sustainability? And you will see that uh, we try to argue that uh, actually increase in productivity is beneficial to uh, sustainability. Uh, our system is a complex one, as you all know. Uh, people are influencing nature, and that's the, the, the blue box on the, on the right and the arrow coming on the top all over to nature. But in turn, nature provides to people. Uh, all that is done in the context of, of increasing population, uh, Francis has talked about it, changing needs, uh, the way we feed ourselves and the way we, we want and, and what we desire to have on the table has been evolving uh, dramatically over the years. And, and there is change in the productive land availability. So as our, our urban area are growing, many countries are facing the challenge of a decreasing area 
available for food production. Um, all that in the context of externalities as well, uh, both negative and positive. Uh, climate change is influencing in many ways, uh, very often in a negative way and sometimes in positive one. Uh, our technology and the capacity of our system to, to generate production and protect the environment is also changing dramatically and providing us with new tools that we could not have dreamed of in the past. So basically, uh, what we see is that if, and I'm, I'm going to be talking to the uh, small equation on the, on the uh, bottom right part, if we see uh, an increase in productivity and we see the right change in demands away from uh, wasteful uh, protein to, to more, those that are more, more efficient, we actually can make it work and we, we can meet uh, the people needs and we can provide for a sustainability over the long term and a way to ensure that we were able to, um, to provide the food. That is, I think, uh, an, an equation and a challenge um, you have been facing in your work every day. I'm not gonna be pretending that uh, I am a specialist on the, the, the food side. What we, can, what we can provide you is the elements on the nature side. Let's uh, turn to the next one about the agri-food transition. Um, when we looked at the type of change we're considering with the global biodiversity framework, uh, there is a number of systems that will be impacted. Agriculture, agri-food system, uh, extractive industries, um, the infrastructure uh, sector, but none are more affected than the agri-food system. This system transformation will be uh, probably one of the biggest we, we face, both in terms of scale, uh, um, in terms of the importance of the change. Um, if, I, if I was uh, brave enough to do a, a, a comparison, we've seen in climate change some transition, and you've seen a very successful transition away from coal. And, and that is a very challenging and difficult transition in the sense that uh, uh, people have been asked to find other ways to sustain themselves in their communities. Agriculture is not about that. We're gonna need food and we're gonna need more food, but what we're gonna need is that food to be produced in a very different way. Also in terms of scope, uh, ranging from, from uh, the production side to the consumption side, going through transformation, supply chain, etc. And, and we're very, very happy to see the agri-food industry uh, very much engaged with us and actually probably pushing us uh, rather than being dragged by anybody else. To do that, it's gonna be in, important to integrate all drivers of change. Um, I think we, what we don't want is to have on the Monday, the climate change team showing up on the doorstep of the agriculture ministry and on the Tuesday, the biodiversity one, and then the health one, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna to need to integrate all those requirements into one set and have one window access uh, to the industry. That will mean a number of, of, of things, including the creation from our scientists of integrated scenario planning. All those uh, planning tools will, will need to, to be stepped down at the regional, national, and perhaps local level and, and there again, we can learn a lot from the climate uh, uh, lessons and, and the success and see how they've been able to adapt uh, their program at a level that makes a, a difference. This is uh, the, the next slide is the one before last. Um, we've been following your work very closely. It has been a, a pleasure to, uh, to meet some of you when we were in Rome in February, and I'm looking forward to uh, the next time we can, we can be together. But I think we've created some very useful and long-standing links among us. In a sense, we will be successful, each of us, if we're successful together. There will not be a failure for one. There will be a failure for all. So we, we, we're, whether we like it or not, uh, we're, I think we have to work together, and, and, and we're going to need to work together. We're facing some dramatic change in large part of our economy, and that's going to be very important. We need integrated science and modeling that is relevant, repeating a little bit what I've said in the previous slide, and, and we need to work together. I sense a, a great willingness to, to do so. I was very encouraged and heartwarmed 
by what I heard from the summary from, from your, your deliberation of yesterday. And you can count on us on, uh, on uh, being there to help you uh, just knock on our door. Let's, uh, let's uh, I've talked about the challenge ahead of us in terms of transition, but um, foremost, I think we need to be the advocate and describe that the future we want is a better future. This is one which, which is gonna be healthier, sustainable, prosperous and, and safe. And, and I think we're not talking enough about that picture of the better future we want and the one we're gonna be building. And it would be well worth the efforts that we're gonna make over the coming year. So uh, co-chairs, uh, this complete our presentation. We're looking forward to working with you and we're absolutely convinced that we can get to success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Basile and Francis, uh, for, for, for your presentation and for, for that very, very comprehensive um, overview of both the process, the content, and the substance of, of the framework uh, that's under development. Uh, you provided all the context of, um, of the development and the negotiations, which is built on the previous um, uh, IG biodiversity targets, as well as the linkage to the sustainable development goals. You indicated the theory of change, which I think is probably the underpinning philosophy for the development of the new framework. Uh, the fact that you highlighted the fact that it is a, you know, a framework for all that is not you know, limited to the biodiversity sector, but all humanity and all systems and all sectors. And that is something that is quite good to hear because uh, the success of the framework that is developed will depend on the involvement and engagement of the different sectors. Uh, you also indicated the structure uh, that you have designed for the purpose of developing uh, the, uh, the framework and the, uh, the next stages and the next uh, steps in, in, in the process. Certainly the involvement of all sectors and all, all, all disciplines is important and crucial to the success. In fact, this is not a choice, it's an imperative that, uh, for it to be successful, linking it to the, both to the climate agenda, but also to to the development issues. Before we go on to the next uh, presentation and also the opportunity to ask questions to the coaches, uh, as we did yesterday to ensure the interactivity of, of this dialogue, uh, my colleagues in the technical unit would display another poll that would engage you in. Um, so we'll look forward to your responses to, to this poll. Uh, the answers will be presented um, right after this or after the next presentation. So this is focuses on also the context of the global framework. For this poll, you can um, choose as many of the responses as you think appropriate. Right, I think we've had sufficient time for, for the responses. So subsequently, in a few moments, yes, my colleagues will display the results of the choices. As you can see, yeah, the vast majority saw that fostering interdisciplinary research work and innovation uh, and cross-sectoral evaluation efforts is a major challenge, including the promotion of incentive schemes and rewards for ecosystem management. Also high uh, is the involvement of indigenous people, women, youth, and producer communities. So thank you very much uh, for, for that and for your engagement in the process.
uh, moving forward now, uh, as you know, the convention, as well as the other biodiversity related conventions are of great importance in the context of enhancing sustainability in agriculture at large. Uh, as already highlighted by the FAO Director General and several other speakers, FAO has actively engaged in several biodiversity related issues and is committed to conserving the world's biodiversity and to its sustainable use. In fact, it was in recognition of the vital importance of biodiversity to the future food security and nutrition and for ending hunger in the world that the FAO governing bodies approved the strategy for mainstreaming biodiversity across agricultural sectors and an action plan for its implementation. I'm therefore pleased to call Mr. Eduardo Mansour, who is the Director, Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment, to provide an overview of this strategy. So Eduardo, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kent. Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. Uh, my colleagues here in FAO gave me the honor to speak at this high level segment to bring to you an information on the FAO strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across the agricultural sectors. So I hope that I'm sharing my slide, my, my screen correctly with you, uh, as uh, we have a quick presentation to reinforce and to illustrate to you where we are. As uh, it has been so well stressed by the, the presenters, uh, Mr. Ogwau and Mr. Van Havre, who gave us this excellent introduction and presentation of the, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and where we stand now, uh, it, it matches what they said and it has been discussed also yesterday that agricultural sectors have been very high in the role to secure sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity. And this role will become even more important now that we gradually engage in, the, in a green response and a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and face uh, continuing growth in terms of uh, demand on agricultural products. Uh, regarding specifically the, the support to countries and the action that the two co-chairs so beautifully said that uh, producing a new paper is not gonna be different if we don't put it in practice. And it was a message that we captured very well. Let me tell you how FAO is looking for it. We had recent developments uh, in the last three years, from 2019 to 2021, that changed the way that we put the framework to work in biodiverse mainstreaming. And I like very much the way, being, not being an English language uh, native speaker, how to translate mainstreaming sometimes is difficult, but if we put it in Spanish, for instance, la integración de la biodiversidad en los sectores de agrícolas, the integration. Uh, uh, this, this, this is easier for me to visualize for us who are not English speaking, how, they, how it's important. And, and how FAO did this, in 2019, we had the, the publication of the State of World Biodiversity for Food and Agriculture that gave us plenty of information. In 2020, we published upon a discussion in our statutory boards, the FAO strategy for mainstreaming biodiversity across agricultural sectors that required us to produce a revised, uh, a, a, an action plan uh, uh, for the period 2021, 2023 to implement the, the strategy. And it's called revised in the title because it has been deeply discussed. It has a 56 uh, key actions proposed and uh, it has been deeply discussed in our regional conferences, in our technical commission, committees, uh, in the program committee, and it has been finally approved by our council uh, uh, last April, uh, and the council report adopted by the conference uh, last June. So uh, we have a fresh, from the oven, action plan that reflects not only what the FAO technical group produced, but the, the, the commitment of the FAO membership with mainstreaming uh, biodiversity in the agricultural sector, which is called la integración de la biodiversidad 
in los sectores agrícolas. So, uh, I just want to quickly brief you on where we are. The strategy aims mainstreaming agricultural sectors at national, regional, and international levels in a structured, coherent manner, taking into account national priorities, their needs, regulations, policies, and country programming frameworks. The result expect is to reduce the negative impacts of agricultural practice on biodiversity, to promote sustainable agricultural practice, which is the backbone of our work in FAO, sustainable agri-food systems, and to conserve, enhance, preserve, and restore biodiversity as a whole. Uh, the, the, the strategy has four outcomes, uh, and the action plan is designed around these four outcomes. So they are uh, aiming to support, uh, to provide support to members upon their requests, to enhance the capacity for mainstreaming biodiversity, to have biodiversity mainstreamed across FAO uh, policies, programs, and activities, to have the role of biodiversity in these ecosystem services for food security and nutrition globally recognized, hence the importance of global frameworks and global dialogues that we are having this today, and the coordination and delivery of the FAO work on biodiversity strengthening. And this has happened uh, upon the, the, I would say, rather revolutionary change that the Director General, the new Director General of FAO, Dr. Chu Don Yu, uh, promoted since last year uh, with the, this uh, a, a horizontal uh, 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 um, implementation of the, the our, 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 our organic chapter or our organic uh, structure. We have now an office that integrates biodiverse climate change and environment that works with the other units in FAO to deliver its program. So it's, it's, it's not anymore a pyramidal structure divided in blocks, but it's a horizontal structure where we link climate change, biodiversity, environment with the other units in FAO. Uh, the action plan, uh, the development of the action plan for the implementation of the strategy was a requirement of the strategy and uh, received as a comment with you, strong uh, inputs from our technical committees, from our statutory body. It was adopted last, um, last uh, uh, April. Uh, it, its content uh, is focused on the strategy outcomes, as I mentioned, uh, the core functions of FAO, the key actions on biodiversity, 56 of them, the monitoring systems that it, it is open for review and update, it's for three years, and uh, in an access brings its uh, core action areas and FAO strategic framework. Let me illustrate to you, uh, just in one case, because I want to call attention, out of the 56 actions, the action number one is to support countries in the implementation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So we are very, very keen and very anxious waiting for every single step that the co-chairs have so nicely described to us because our commitment is to move ahead at that. How do we do this? We have plenty of activities related to biodiversity, more than 100 projects at this moment, uh, concentrating on contributing to different aspects of biodiversity. We, we are a very active agency uh, implementing together with the Global Environmental Facility on the biodiversity framework. And uh, I will close, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, uh, with a, a note of uh, opportunity. We see the UN decade on ecosystem restoration that we launched this year, and FAO is honored to, to co-lead with the UNEP in its implementation. Uh, with every single uh, multilateral environmental agreement, especially the Rio Conventions, uh, the opportunity to, to implement the actions of the post-2020 global framework and the FAO action plan of the, F, uh, of the strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across agricultural sectors. So uh, the, um, I, I, I stop here with uh, a thank you for the opportunity and saying that the FAO is ready to engage in its different instances, being it in our normative work, in our project work, in our country offices, in our regional offices, uh, in this horizontal way that's promoted by the Director General that we work, we work integrated inside and with partners to mainstream biodiversity and make sure that sustainable agriculture and agri-food systems are achieved. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Eduardo, for, for that. Uh, as you all can see, uh, 
we decided to bring this segment right after the presentation of uh, the framework by the co-chairs of the working group. Uh, it shows that we are speaking the same language. We share the same concerns and we see the same opportunities. And it is only by working together and by harmoni harmonizing and integrating our different approaches that we can achieve greater success. So thank you so much, Eduardo, for that. And um, uh, before we go on again, uh, as is previously done, uh, we'll also run another poll quickly. And then after that, we'll entertain some questions for the co-chairs, uh, as well as Eduardo or any other FAO officer that you might want to ask a question. So our poll right now is uh, talking about some of the enabling mechanisms, as uh, both Basil and Francis talked about, that uh, we cannot just have a piece of paper. It's certainly in, important to have both the systems in place and the resources to ensure that we are able to implement what um, we adopt. And the questions also seek to check the level of involvement and engagement, but uh, also to encourage you as we move forward to be more involved and to further uh, expand the scope of um, stakeholders that are involved. And the range of activities that you can undertake and how you link your daily, daily life activities and endeavors and spending as well in um, supporting the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. So I think um, we'll have sufficient time to have um, some responses. So if we can run the result quickly. As you can see, the largest um, or the biggest proportion or percentage of uh, Answers so good governance and investment as a major challenge. Certainly, we take note of that. Certainly, what we're saying, and I think something that both Francis and Basil had highlighted. And then they see a lot of sense of responsibility in responding to what you do, but that we encourage to do more of those, including buying at local farmers markets and ensuring that how you spend your money is also contributing directly or indirectly to to support the objectives of the convention and the and the principles that um, underline underpin in that. So thank you very much, uh, colleagues, uh, distinguished uh, guests, and excellencies, for for this. At this juncture, I'll hand over to my colleague Rene Hoffman to help uh, moderate the rest of the program for this morning. Thank you very much. So, thank Irene, you. Thank you very much, Kent, and thank you very much to the co-chairs and Eduardo to give us their insights. Um, there are a few questions which maybe we ask you to respond now, and then we will invite the views of the bureau members of FAO governing and uh, technical bodies to give their views on the post-2020 framework. Um, I have a question for, for Francis and Basil. So how are the planning, monitoring, and reporting and review mechanisms envisaged to support an effective implementation of the framework to ensure that all targets are met? And what is concretely the role the agricultural sectors can play? That's a big question. And Francis, maybe I'll start. And, and as usual, you can correct and, and add to my remarks. Um, the, 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 the detail of that uh, planning, uh, monitoring, reporting, and review system are being discussed. And as you can imagine, when you move to 
the next step in uh, in this. This is always a, a complex discussion. What uh, what we envisage is, is that uh, there is actually two fundamental different function in that system. We're going to set some global targets. You heard the proposal about uh, protecting and conserving 30 percent of uh, of the planet, uh, which, by the way, uh, in many cases could include productive uh, landscape. Um, but that's a global target, and the capacity of various countries are are very different. Um, just to to take uh, Francis and my country. Uh, they're, they're very, very, very different. So we're going to need to understand what each country is, is planning and offering to do. And we need to tally that up and see if it's add up to the, the goal we set ourselves for. And if not, have mechanism to increase ambition to, to get to that goal. So that is what, let's say, we're going to be calling the ambition system. Once that is done, there is a second task, which is about how are we doing on each of those ambitions? Let's imagine that uh, a country decide because it's got a lot of uh, wild space that it's gonna protect 35%. And, and, and at the end of the 10 year period, has that been done? How far are we from that goal? So that's the kind of the action result part of the framework. So we're gonna need to have a system that accommodate for those two functions and enable us to, to know whether the action we set ourselves to take under those 20 targets are leading to the result we're expecting in terms of state of the uh, biodiversity. Now, how is that relevant to you and, and how is uh, are your organization going to interface with that? Um, I, I definitely uh, see a system that is open and able to get the information where it resides. Uh, your system have a lot of information in terms of uh, how agriculture is and forestry and fisheries are carried out uh, around the globe. And it is not going to be the, the role of the CBD to replicate or duplicate that. So uh, the hope is that we're going to be able to work together and access those information. And if we can make good use of existing system like the sustainable development goals and performance indicators that exist on those goals, all the better. Uh, you will see, if you look at the technical documents around performance indicators and the CBD, constant reference to the SDGs. And, and we're very pleased to see uh, the uh, uh, statistical agencies uh, around the world and together in their UN institution being very much engaged into that. So we see a system that is basically modular, open, and not trying to replicate. Francis, over to you. And I'd shape it uh, in a very uh, rough way. What do you think is important? So, sorry. Hello. Yeah, let me just add a few points to what um, uh, Coach Herr Basil has said, I think he has pointed to most of it. Um, something also that is going to come in, and you will see it, um, we are going to keep talking about it, is the idea of responsibility and transparency by all, you know, people that uh, all countries or parties or stakeholders when it comes to implementing this framework, that we should have that in mind. But for people then to be able to take on the responsibility and report as required, then the mechanisms, as uh, Co-Chair has said, uh, to guide that is going to come up when the SBI finalizes this meeting, the third meeting. But something that I wanted also to add here is that um, the framework itself has got, of course, a monitoring framework, and that monitoring framework has got, uh, will have headline indicators that uh, we, all parties, to the convention will be required to report on and also other countries, I would say. So those headline indicators are like the ones that definitely we have to use to report progress. So that is one way of helping, um, you know, uh, parties or stakeholders out there to ensure that this aspect of reporting, monitoring and reporting, we are able to follow it to the letter. And there will also be other uh, indicators, the one that is with the components of, of, of each of those targets. So that, those are some of the ways in which we think FAO could be 
could you make use of it if you look at those headline indicators, see how those targets relate to your work, and then therefore it will assist you to, to contribute to reporting progress as far as the targets are concerned, because there could be some of these targets that uh, you could use in um, reporting on what you're doing that could, we could capture in the system as far as the framework implementation is concerned. So that is, those are some of the ideas that is there about uh, planning and monitoring reporting, but you'll be seeing them as we move along. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much to stressing also the link to the sustainable development goals. And as you all know, FAO is a custodian for many of the biodiversity related uh, SDGs indicators. So we are, uh, of course, happy to con continue to, to do that uh, role. We have a question from Luca Cinotti from WWF, who would like to know, whether you can give some more detail on the focus and also the framing of targets eight and nine. And a little bit related to this uh, is maybe a, a additional information on how the entire food and agriculture stakeholders can be engaged in the implementation in, of the framework not only FAO as an organization. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me start by talking, uh, kind of reversing the other. Um, I, we see that uh, we will be successful if we engage all aspect and all corner of society. That includes civil society and, and they have an important role to play. Um, my vision of a successful COP and a successful um, framework negotiation is one where I would get everyone on the podium clapping with uh, Francis and I, which is, which is a very different picture of uh, a, the formal protocol way of doing things. We're we going to need to have as a symbol, not only negotiators, but, but also uh, business, civil society, our, our scientists, like we need everybody proud and engaged into that framework. And that's, that's the way we're going to be successful. Practically, how we make that happen the day after the, the party is, is going to be very different from countries to countries. Um, I can see some, some very interesting initiatives started under the, uh, the UN Food Summit, those vertical dialogues that are taking place in many countries will hopefully lead to a more permanent structure where you can have a good dialogue between the various stakeholders and engagement in a, a consensus way to get to the implementation. That has been something that has proved successful in many parts of the world. Now, turning to target eight and nine uh, and, and how we, we, we see those targets, um, I think you cannot look at target eight and nine without looking at target four at the same time. And, in this, and I know that there are several parties that would like them to be grouped different way. I think Francis and I have tried to arrange the piece of this jigsaw puzzle in all the possible ways. And, and what you're gonna see Monday on, uh, on draft one is our best attempt to have a, a, an arrangement that works. But at the end of the day, the question is, does that matter uh, the way they organize? Or what is matter is, do we have the right elements in that, uh, in that uh, uh, plate we get in front of us. So, so four is about making activities sustainable. Eight is about making sure those activities are meeting people need. And, and, and uh, under eight, there is the fishery aspect, but there is also uh, the uh, harvest, hunting, and, and gathering that are sustainably, that are sustainably sustaining the livelihood of many uh, local communities and, and, their, and their direct uh, provision for food and shelter. So that's what we see in, in eight and, and that particular focus on the poor. Nine is different. It's focusing at the ecosystem level and, 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 and not at the large scale landscape, but more kind of the managed ecosystem of uh, agriculture in a certain region or forestry or aquaculture, and, and how we ensure that those activities while being carried out sustainably are providing the elements and the meeting people need. 
So this is part of our attempt to rebalance the objective of the convention. I think uh, several people on the biodiversity side would like to see a convention that is solely focused on conservation. We think this would be a mistake. It has to be a, con a convention that balances the two objectives. And that's where we touch very much and integrate with the FAO work. And that's where we want to be careful to have the right level of engagement that is not uh, overtaking or not uh, impairing what you're doing. Francis. Uh, thank you, Co-Chair. I think um, just to add something little to what you've said here <clears throat> is that um, we, of course, got some comments, we got some views, we had a lot during the recently concluded um, Substar 24th and the SBI 3, the meetings which took place virtually. So there were thoughts and ideas that also comments that came on this targets and other targets. So at this point in time, I can only tell you that we have looked at these targets again. And um, in the next version of the framework itself, that is the draft one, you might see it, um, some progress there. But we do not take note, of course, that um, target eight and nine, we are mainly looking at how the, the food security, the adult aspect, can continue to exist, and also including in the cultural sector, so that um, we have better nutrition for people. And in that case, you'll find us talking about management of species, because I think that is one area that is so critical in that sector, management of species, fauna and flora. So there is effort to really um, refocus these uh, two targets, which you've just pointed. And um, I think at this point in time, we may not now be at, uh, you call it at, we don't have that um, opportunity, if not the, 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 what is the power now to relay to you as is. We know what we've gone through in trying to recraft those two. So I can only say you might see something that is uh, better recrafted in the next version. So be looking out for that. And um, in target nine, we are talking about really biodiversity supporting productivity in the agricultural sector and maybe the other way around. But biodiversity itself has a big role it plays to ensure that productivity in the agricultural sector continues to be not only sustainable, but also resilient over time. So you'll see that uh, we, we will handle that and you'll be seeing them shortly, as I said, on 12th. This should be going up uh, for everybody to have a look at. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much. I think it's, it's good to hear that this link between the management and the use and contribution to people are closely linked, um, even if they are in different boxes in the system, but that the narrative shows very clearly the importance of this, because I, I think this is also a question for us to communicate to our constituencies, is that some of the practices that you use, they are biodiversity friendly, but when you manage them, you also have productivity increases, you save input costs for producers, and that's the language that speaks to farmers. Um, we have another question from Sunil Arshak. How can we encourage private investment in biodiversity conservation and utilization? And how can really the private sector be more engaged? This is, of course, you said already that uh, you have had positive response from the private sector of the food and agriculture. Um, yeah, how can this be strengthened? Um, very, very important point. Um, there is, when we talk to, to business, actually, I think business as a whole and the private sector has learned a lot through the climate change process. Um, and, and perhaps they're ahead of us and they're better organized and they want to move faster. I think there is several elements that are needed to improve 
and, and, and have better private sector in, investment. One is uh, a level playing field. So uh, I've talked earlier about negative incentive and subsidies. So if you have not, a, not even a positive playing field with the subsidies in favor of uh, biodiversity, but just a level one where you don't have subsidies for unsustainable activities, then that's, that's one step. The second step is business needs to be to have predictability in, uh, in their operation. That's what they're looking for. They need to know where they are and they that will enable them to make investments. So we need to have a framework that is there and that is there for long term. So 10 year period is an horizon that many business will, uh, are planning to, and, and that's gonna be helping us. If they see the signal that are consistent across from the agriculture sector to the environment, a very clear set of guidance and rule, then they will be inv investing. The third point is understanding their risk and exposure. Mm -hmm. I was talking with uh, the agri-food business and we were talking about sugar beet production in, uh, in France and, and, and how, uh, given climate change, how that's going to be changing very rapidly and very dramatically over the coming years. Wheat production in the south of Europe will also be changing. So understanding those risks and understanding how investors are exposing the, those risks will be enabling to the money to go where it is sustainable. So organization that will be having business plans that enable them to manage, to mitigate those risks and shift their operation in, in, in our changing environment will be attracting the resource. You can see it on the climate side. You can see how money has been shifting around to durable energy uh, production away from unsustainable energy production. I think we're gonna see that shift taking place in a much more rapid way on the biodiversity side once we put the basic element in place. Francis. Yeah, I think the issue of the private sector has actually been uh, one of the uh, aspects discussed in the CBD now for a long time. Um, when I joined CBD around um, maybe 2005, there about, um, what followed next was COP decisions that physically focused on biodiversity and business. And if you go to, I think, COP decisions from COP 8, 9, 10, and so forth, you'll find specific COP decisions, actually, that were made to link uh, biodiversity and business, and therefore bringing the private sector into play. So we, I would say that within the CBD, the, the, the role of the private sector has opted, opted actually been um, recognized over time, but maybe in the post 2020 now, uh, given the challenges the world is facing today, the business sector actually need to realize more that um, loss of biodiversity risk to business because they might be putting money in agriculture, they might be putting money in uh, tourism, they might be putting money in some of these other sectors. But if biodiversity aspects are not being considered in such investments, then they might find that their investment may not yield what they're actually anticipating it to yield. So the conservation angle now need to be taking more roots in the private sector uh, way of doing business, including, of course, like it is happening, them integrating a lot on, on, on climate change. So I think we need to be emphasizing that message and see how it can actually better be actualized. They, they, I would say the ideas are there, what we want to do is there, but now we need to put those ideas into action. We've talked with them, we've had these meetings with the private sector business, but I think that has to keep going on. And when we now start implementing the framework, we still need to see how we keep engaging them so that they can also be conscious when they are doing business when they're providing investment in whichever sector, if they are going to really take biodiversity conservation as one of those pillars they want to see in the business that is being conducted, I think that is one way the private sector will contribute a lot to conservation and therefore the future of biodiversity, the global supply. So thank you so much. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I mean, we all know that the World Economic Forum Risk Report and McKinsey and all these big companies 
they get the reflection from CEOs that particularly the biodiversity loss is a big threat to business. So it's money that speaks and the agricultural and food and drink sectors are particularly affected. And in that respect, I think you will be happy to hear that in the discussion yesterday, we had a lot of discussion about financing, repurposing subsidies and so on. And there was even the idea to have a biodiversity financing mechanism that mirrors the one for climate change. Of course, this is uh, uh, just ideas coming out from a global dialogue, but I think it shows how the, the agenda is, is changing. Um, I, I we have a lot of speakers waiting that would also give their view on the post 2020 framework. And um, you had mentioned already that FAO has a very important role to play as a policy body, but also as an implementer and as a monitoring agency. And Eduardo had mentioned that the FAO members have been very active and revved up action on biodiversity in collaboration also with the CBD, particularly in the recent years. So they have created an informal group of friends of biodiversity, which is composed of uh, ambassadors. Then you all know that FAO hosts a whole range of bodies and instruments that make reference to biodiversity. We host uh, the International Plant Protection Convention and the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, which are member of the Biodiversity Liaison Group, but also the Technical Committees, the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. And today we have with us representatives of some of these bodies, and they want to share their perspective of the importance of the biodiversity for, for the food and agriculture sectors, but also the um, significance of the post-2020 framework. So I would like to first call on Ms. Yasmina El Bahul. She is chairperson of the governing body of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture to give her view on the framework. You Ms. Baul, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Hoffman, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Dear all, I am really delighted to contribute to this global and very important event. Let me start by thanking the co-chairs of the open-ended working group on the post-2020 for the very de detailed update and insightful reflections on the ongoing process towards the development and adoption of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. During its last session, the governing body of the International Treaty requested the Bureau, with the support of the Secretariat, to engage the preparation of the post-2020 in the development and implementation of the global biodiversity framework once adopted. In this context, the governing body also emphasized the importance of enhancing through this process cooperation between the international treaty and the CBD and with other biodiversity related conventions and made the following key recommendations. Targets that link agriculture, biodiversity to food security and sustainable agriculture should be included as part of the framework Having followed the process, it seems that we are moving to the right direction to achieve such linkages. Let's ensure that we stay on this path going forward in the process. When it comes to the genetic level of biodiversity, emphasis should not be placed only on access and benefit sharing, but also on conservation and sustainable use as this contribute to achieving the objective of ABS. Targets on access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their utilization should expressly consider 
the international treaty and its multilateral system of access and benefit sharing and their monitoring should relay inter alia on the monitoring system available through the reporting systems of the international treaty. In relation to means of the implementation, the treaty strategies and mechanisms can be a good reference and should play a central role in the framework in relation to plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, I am reiterating that the Bureau of the Governing Body of the International Treaty looks forward to, along with the Secretariat of the International Treaty, to continue engaging and providing inputs in the development and implementation of the framework once it is adapted. I will conclude as a temporary person living on this planet by saying that I'm very glad to participate to this very important event for the planet and for our future. We have to catch the signal of the current hard and uncertain situation and dig deep into ourselves to better understand what we are doing now for biodiversity, what we can do individually and collectively in the time and space. And as reported earlier by our distinguished speakers, it's time to translate policies into concrete actions every day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Elbaoul. Now, the next speaker is from the International Plant Protection Convention. I invite Mr. John Grafer who is the uh, a vice chair of the bureau. Thank you and um, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Let me begin by thanking the organizers of the event for inviting the International Plant Protection Convention to join you today. We do appreciate this opportunity to share our perspectives about the post-2020 biodiversity framework. Now, the IPPC and the commission is composed of of uh, national plant protection authorities from 184 countries. We've had an important relationship with the CBD over the past 20 plus years. In particular, we share a core goal of seeking to prevent the spread of harmful pests, which not only endanger agriculture, but also forests, natural habitats, and biodiversity. The IPPC Secretariat has also been a member of the Biodiversity Liaison Group since 2015. Given our overlapping missions, the IPPC community believes that the post-2020 biodiversity framework should take into account the shared mandate of the IPPC and CBD, especially in relation to, the, to managing the invasive alien species threat. That is really our shared focus. Um, over the past 25 years, the IPPC has been in the business of developing international plant health standards and other key guidance materials, which are designed to prevent the spread of potentially harmful pests. These standards are intended to enhance and harmonize the efforts of governments from around the world to survey, detect, and contain the spread of plant pests, especially through trade pathways. We believe that a coordinated international framework has been and remains crucial to ensure coherency and ensure our collective efforts and effectiveness in managing the global spread of pests. Clearly, the IPPC CBD relationship is key for ensuring this coordinated approach. We remain committed enhancing our collaborative efforts to protect the world's plant resources from invasive plant pests going forward. Now, in March of this year, the IPPC Commission adopted a new 10-year strategic framework. That framework contains several key elements, which we believe directly contribute to the goals of protecting global biodiversity. I want to share these three specific examples or elements from the IPPC's framework, which we think are relevant as we develop 
and refine the 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. First, the IPPC's new strategic plan reaffirms the IPPC goal of safeguarding plant resources in the natural environment. The new framework recognizes the impact that climate change will have on biology, distribution, and spread of pests into new areas, including natural habitats. Going forward, the IPPC will continue to progress standards and provide other guidance which deal directly with the movement of pests that threaten biodiversity. This, inclu this includes invasive pests which are now moving through new pathways such as sea containers, air containers, and other conveyances. A second important objective in our new strategic framework is to strengthen the capacity of countries to detect, assess, and report emerging pest threats, which would allow for a more rapid early response. To this end, the IPPC members are seeking to improve country surveillance and pest detection capabilities, build streamlined and timely reporting systems, promote contingency plans to support an immediate response to new serious pest incursions, and create a new mechanism for identifying experts and potential donors to assist when a serious pest incursion appears to be morphing into a major outbreak. A third relevant objective in our new strategic plan is to address e-commerce. The astonishing growth in e-commerce has allowed consumers to shop in the global marketplace and have all kinds of products and materials delivered to their doorstep. This has serious implications for the potential spread and introduction of invasive species into new areas. Under our new strategic framework, the IPPC Commission has committed itself to developing the tools and the collaborative strategies for preventing and mitigating the movement of pests and pest host materials through these new digital commercial channels. We wanna leave you with three key messages. First is that the IPPC has over the course of its history developed essential phytosanitary infrastructure at the national, regional, and global level. We believe that this infrastructure can play an important role in managing invasive species as pests. We encourage ministers of, uh, of the environment, CBD focal points, and national plant protection organizations to cooperate towards the prevention and management of invasive alien species as a joint goal. Specifically, we believe that the focus on an approach for managing invasive species should include the concept of safe trade and consider both intentional and unintentional introductions of invasive species. Second, we, would, we should learn from the past and, and try to be practical in the metrics we choose to assess our impact and progress in reducing the spread and introduction of, of invasive alien species. We may want to consider methods to track early and increase detection and interceptions of invasive alien species, as well as metrics to assess the effectiveness of eradication programs to reduce or eliminate the, their impact on biodiversity and ecosystems. From the IPPC perspective, there is no single global method to record the impact of invasive alien species. It is difficult to develop such a list at a global level because of the risk varies between countries, areas, and regions. It may be possible, however, to develop a national or regional list which identify invasive alien species of greatest concern. In this regard, IPPC member countries have the ability to generate pest reporting data for invasive species they have analyzed and have identified as top concerns. IPPC efforts to improve pest reporting systems may provide valuable data for establishing baseline information, as well as assessing the impacts of future pest prevention strategies. Our third and final point would be is that plans for 
setting performance goals, targets, and metrics need to be accompanied by investments and resources in such activities like communications and capacity development. For example, investments will be needed in surveillance and early detection. This is consistent with a core IPPC view that prevention is better, is a better objective than eradication or management. I will stop here by thanking the organizers for giving the IPPC community an opportunity to speak today. And we look forward to working with the CBD and the other entities and doing what we, all, what we can to help safeguard the world's plant resources going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for the interest of the audience, I could also highlight that the role of the IPPC in standard setting on invasive alien species is very strongly reflected in the FAO action plan for the implementation of this biodiversity mainstreaming strategy. Um, so let me now turn to the Committee on Agriculture. I invite Mr. Rajenda, who is the chairperson of the committee for his response. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I would like to compliment the organizers for uh, uh, for this uh, wonderful event. I would also like to thank you uh, for inviting me to share my views. It is an honor for me to participate in this panel of the global dialogue and the role of food and agriculture in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and share with you the related key outcomes of the 27th session of the Committee on Agriculture Quag which was held from 28th September to 2nd October 2020. The committee considered the implementation of FAO strategy on biodiversity mainstream across agricultural sectors and welcomed progress made in its implementation, provided detailed comments on and inputs to the draft 2021-23 action plan for the implementation of the FAO strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across agriculture sectors. As you're aware, the 2021-23 action plan for the implementation of FAO strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across agriculture sectors has been adopted by the 166th FAO Council in April 2021. It was developed in an inclusive and transparent manner with inputs from members and all technical committees the group of national focal points for biodiversity for food and agriculture at the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, Program Committee and the Council. As COAG Chairperson, I'm pleased to reiterate that the COAG Bureau and members, the FAO Action Plan and the development for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework are of high importance. We are regularly briefed and the progress made in the implementation of the action plan and related activities in, a record, in accordance with the guidance given by the co-op. I welcome the continued engagement of FAO and members in the implementation of the action plan, along with the promotion of sustainable practices that are biodiversity friendly and deliver healthy food and prosperity for all while preserving our natural resources. Coop 27 underlined the critical contribution of biodiversity to food security and nutrition and the need for co coordination at cross-sectoral and uh, sectoral level. As we are moving towards the next Coop 28 uh, session that will be held in July 2022, we expect that biodiversity will be very high on the agenda in view of the essential role for food and agriculture and to many rural uh, livelihoods. For the same reason, the outcome of the global dialogue for the development for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and the 15th session of the Conference of Parties of Convention on Bio Biological Diversity to be held in coming next uh, October 2021, that is COP15, will be 
relevant to the next co-op session and will consult with the members on how best consider this. So I don't want to highlight the co-op 27 recommendations which are already available, Madam Chair. So thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much. And also thank you for stressing that biodiversity will be on the agenda of Quark 28 to continue the deliberations and being informed by what comes out of the meeting today as well as COP15. I will now uh, call on the vice chair of the Committee on Forestry, which is Mr. Yusuf Serengil. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Your Excellency, dear audience, I would like to first thank to the organizers of this global event and inviting us to provide their views. Um, now I would like to share the view of COFO on the role of food and agriculture in the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. At its 25th session held in October 2020, the Committee on Forestry welcomed the launch of the State of the World's Forests 2020, jointly prepared by FAO and UNEP, and it's time to focus on forests by diversity and people. It invited members to take the key findings of SOFO 2020 into consideration in the negotiations of the post-2020 biodiversity framework as appropriate, so as to reflect the critical role that forests and sustainable forest management play in the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. COFO also requested FAO to contribute to the efforts of Convention on Biological Diversity and other organizations and processes to strengthen the work on forest biodiversity. According to SOFO 2020, forests cover 31% of the global land area and harbor most of Earth's terrestrial biodiversity. Forests also make many significant contributions to food security, livelihoods, and poverty alleviation. At the same time, SOFO 2020 also recalled that deforestation and forest degradation continue to take place at alarming rates, and that agricultural expansion remains as the main driver of this development. The future of biodiversity and humankind is thus strongly interlinked and mutually dependent on how we manage the world's forests. And ensuring positive outcomes for both biodiversity and people requires a careful balance between conservation goals and the needs of people, especially, especially those ones living in or nearby forests. COFO invited members to strengthen the mainstreaming of biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable use, of, use in the forest sector and collaboration with other relevant sectors in this regard. It further requested FAO to strengthen forestry considerations in its work on mainstreaming biodiversity across agricultural sectors and to conduct the review of biodiversity mainstreaming in forestry and share good practices on solutions that balance conservation and sustainable use of forest biodiversity. COFO highlighted the importance of forest biodiversity for ecosystem services and food security and expressed concerns about the continued loss of biodiversity. It further stressed the need to deliver on global commitments, including in the framework of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. COFO requested FAO to raise awareness on drivers of forced biodiversity loss and how to address them. It also requested FAO to step up actions to halt deforestation forest degradation and loss of forest biodiversity and support members in their efforts, including through fostering various forms of international cooperation. Furthermore, COFO requested FAO to continue to demonstrate that solutions that balance conservation and sustainable use of forest biodiversity, such as sustainable forest management, restoration and agroforestry are possible 
through sharing best practices in line with national capacities, priorities, and contacts, and that agriculture and forestry can synergistically support sustainable development. Thank you. Over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for conveying the message of the Committee on Fisheries uh, Forestry. I think it's, it's very important to, to note that the Committee uh, on Forestry as of fisheries, we have here a specific situation because for FAO, these sectors are part of agriculture. For the CBD, they are not part of agriculture in the narrow sense. And therefore, the messages that the committee sent to inside the uh, sectors, but also to the biodiversity community on the sustainable management and the food security aspects of their sectors are very important. I now invite the last speaker of this session, Ms. René Sauvé, she is the Vice Chair of the Committee on Fisheries. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and um, greetings to uh, distinguished colleagues. Uh, I would also like to thank the co-chairs for that uh, very useful update on the framework. Uh, it is encouraging uh, to see uh, how our sector is intended to be captured in that framework given how important uh, the sector is. The fisheries and aquaculture sector employs millions of people, often the sole source of income for many coastal communities, especially women. So the sector is a driver of economic and social development and therefore relevant for a range of sustainable development goals. Further, the seafood, uh, seafood is playing an increasing significant role in terms of food security. Globally, seafood makes up almost 20% of the animal protein consumed by humans, approximately 3.3 billion people. And in developing countries such as SIDS, this figure jumps to over 50%, making up the majority of animal protein consumed. With arable land decreasing, this seafood trend is only increasing. Since the 1950s, there has been a sevenfold increase in human consumption. It's well recognized that healthy ecosystems are needed to continue to provide all these essential functions. And now it is increasingly evident that healthy oceans are needed to mitigate climate change. As such, a number of emerging targets are underpinned by healthy functioning aquatic ecosystems and productive oceans. Ensuring the sustainable management of these critical aquatic ecosystems through an ecosystem approach to fisheries is something that Kofi and the FAO Secretariat have de dedicated much effort to. As such, an indicator related to ecosystem approaches in this regard in the framework is critical. The Committee on Fisheries is heavily engaged in developing both deterrence for unsustainable practices, such as illegal fishing or derelict fishing gear, a significant contributor to marine litter, and developing the guidance to indeed promote ecosystem, sorry, promote fisheries practices that have a positive biodiversity outcome. Mainstreaming biodiversity objectives into the sectors is key and work on elaborating other effective conservation measures or OECMs. What this means in a fisheries context is an excellent example of mainstreaming. And that terminology is captured in the emerging target two related to 30 by 30. Kofi 34 earlier this year gave clear endorsement to a number of activities in support of biodiversity and is reflected in FAO's Biodiversity Action Plan, including the development of other effective conservation measures for fishers and fisheries management managers, so that the development of fisheries plans and practices that can help incorporate these practices to increase biodiversity. At the risk of stating the obvious, 
The main message here, I think, is that the goals and targets of the global biodiversity framework cannot be achieved without the engagement of the communities that rely on, use, study, manage, and regulate the activities most closely associated with these aquatic ecosystems. It is critical that the global biodiversity framework is developed with those communities, stakeholders, and authorities to ensure that the goals and targets are realistic, effective, and ultimately achievable. Finally, Chair, I might also make the point that the CBD going forward, especially in the context of implementing the global biodiversity strategy, needs to make a dedicated space and time for ocean issues. Marine experts, both policy and technical, including fisheries experts from the FAO, need to be able to see an updated inclusive marine program under the CBD that covers both conservation and sustainable use that they can engage in helping to attain the aspirations laid out in the global biodiversity framework. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, if I add my, my personal comment and also put up my hat as Secretary of the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, summarizing what the different committees have said, there seems to be a question on how and how strongly the um, bodies and the guidances and tools that are developed by FAO will be embedded also formally in the post-2020 framework. And maybe Francis, who is still with us, would like to respond to this question. Hello? Yes. Can you yes. come again with a question? Yeah. Question again, please. Ah, the question again. Yeah. Um, we have heard from the speakers of the IPPC now, uh, COFI uh, treaty, and uh, without it being said, uh, from the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture side, uh, a question on how the, the tools and mechanisms that are being developed by FAO are reflected in the framework and whether there will be a sort of an official reflection of those in the framework in the sense that uh, you had mentioned the role in, in uh, monitoring, but will there be another also the policy role reflected in the framework? Yeah, I, I hope I get to your question well. Um, of course, I think there are these questions being continuously brought to our attention, how uh, we are reflecting um, maybe the, the various uh, aspects of the different stakeholders that we are dealing with in the framework. Because biodiversity being as cross-cutting as it is, so you find that um, it cuts on so many aspects that um, uh, the need for people to see that they are appearing or are reflecting the framework keeps coming up. But I think one thing that we could do here uh, in the framework itself, and I hope this will be coming out more clearly, I think we have first of all linked also the framework itself, the monitoring framework. You will find that we have identified the targets, sorry, the indicators for the SDGs in the framework itself. And then in that, we also then put, we relate it to those indicators of the SDGs and which ones therefore link to which target and then to our own indicators. So that kind of um, scenario, we believe because all these agencies, all the stakeholders that there, most of them report on SDGs. So perhaps, the way you are going to be reporting on your um, SDGs within your agency there, when you look at the way we have tried to align 
those indicators of the SDGs to the one of the framework. And therefore, it could be that it reflects on your sector. I think it will give you a chance to use the tool that um, you are developing. So we, if, if we don't make um, very specific reference, then I think you could be looking at some of those entry points. But we shall continue to look at the monitoring framework and see how it will really be addressing some of these concerns, I must say. So it is, broadly speaking, coming up from different stakeholders. They want to see themselves perhaps uh, much more uh, visibly there in terms of reporting and the indicators, the framework, how it provides that. But I hope that can give us uh, some way out on making sure that uh, the issues raised by FAO and others could be anchored in the framework because we want really people to, to use their tools in reporting because all these other agencies have their own reporting mechanism for sure. So then it is how we try to link the, 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 the targets that we have and our indicators to some of those reporting frameworks like they have that then could help to link them. I think that is how I could say it if I've got it correct. Yeah, th thank you. Um, my point was a bit, it's not only on monitoring, but also on the entire implementation. And the, the goal is to share this burden of implementation equally across. And uh, we will see how this will be reflected. Yeah, um, I think also you will see other sections of the framework. Um, the, 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 the updated zero draft actually had a section that was talking about synergies and so forth. So you are going to see a bit of mention of that because we, we, we also believe that in addition to just having the targets, there should be other, you know, collaboration with some of these MEAs. Uh, or any other agencies out there. So you will see synergies being mentioned in there, both with the uh, other convention related, but also with stakeholders out there in whatever they are doing that relates to biodiversity. It cannot be a one-off uh, thing to be done only by the CBT because there are these cross-cutting uh, aspects that needs to be taken on board. So there are other means of implementation that is also having consideration on some of the things you're raising, enabling conditions. So there are those aspects that will come out. And I think maybe it could help with that. There are this, the, the aspect dealing with the technical, scientific, and um, technological transfer. So all those could be the other avenues that brings on board um, other patterns to see how they can participate in this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question that is directed to all panelists. And this is how can countries improve the effective cross sectoral dialogue and coordination mechanisms for is um, reducing conflicting and complete competing policies, for example, mainstreaming biodiversity in agriculture, fisheries, forestry policies. It, does one of the panelists would like to answer to this question? Well, maybe I can say a few words, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Um, as the committees, uh, we organize meetings. Uh, we have especially some networks about some critical issues, for example, invasive species and other points, uh, forest health, for example. In those events, we come together with uh, countries, representatives, and share our visions, policies, and discuss the issues so that we can um, uh, put out some results, how to make collaboration, how to improve our knowledge, and how to progress. We also share our practices with, with other countries. These committees, for example, in COFO, these are regional committees. And for example, in case of uh, Near East Forestry Commission, the countries are all from the Near East. So they have uh, similar issues. They have similar concerns and uh, we can find solutions. Uh, and we come together with uh, the people that have the same problems. So this is making the uh, 
conflicting issues, uh, solve the conflicting issues inside the commission committees. That's uh, very useful for in terms of forestry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, could I add something? Uh, yes. Yeah, I actually, um, if you look at the updated, sorry, the, yeah, the updated zero draft and uh, the enabling conditions. So there is so much that is said there about partnerships, about synergies with the, all these other relevant agencies. You know, there is just a lot that is mentioned in there. So I believe that becomes the point of, you know, the, the other global community coming into together to implement this work because partnership is going to be very important as we do this because different people have certain activities which they are doing but which collectively could contribute to this. So if you look at the section G of the updated uh, zero draft, you'll find a lot stated in there. I hope that can make uh, colleagues to see that the framework, the way it is being uh, crafted takes into that aspect of bringing as many players on board during implementation itself. Thank you. Thank you. We had in principle a last poll, but I don't know, I see Ms. Semedo, whether you want to say something now or we should do our last poll. Oh, please move ahead. I'm just following. <laughs> this last poll would be a little bit of a check. So I will read it. Um, do you agree with the statement that in your country, the regulatory framework encourages the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity across the agricultural sectors. And there are uh, answers from, I don't know, to fully agree. And then um, where did you see the biggest uh, progress related to food and agriculture production in your country. And the last one, what are the priority benefits of restoration practices for agricultural productivity? Okay. Maybe we can close the poll as the answers are hovering. Okay. The response to the first question is showing us that a lot still needs to be done because the majority of people did not agree. Um, there are areas where biggest progress has been made, which is in efficiency of resource use, but also in food diversity, which is very good news. And also that restoration practices should target at increasing agricultural uh, productivity. So our translation time has come to an end. And I think we had a very productive session with lots of interesting inputs. And I hope that this session has increased the knowledge and understanding of all of us about the post 2020 framework. And we are very much looking forward to the draft version that will be published on next Monday, next week. 
and we will then continue to be engaged in the discussions and I hope to see all of you back in the next session, which will happen at three o'clock in the afternoon, where we will have ministers to give their point of view on the very important issues that we are discussing in this global dialogue. Thank you so much for all your valuable contributions and see you later.